topic today is the uh, 90s, the new 80s. I have to apologize. I'm just recovering from a cold, so I might have spluttering and coughing, but uh, bear with me. I seem to be getting better. So uh, successful aging is 90s, the new 80s, and that's sort of a direct riff of the, uh, the movie Devil's Wear, Devil, The Devil Wears Prada, where there's a line, is six the new two? So in other words, how we get re... Um, uh, how we can expect what's normal. And when I started doing geriatrics about 24 years ago, um, there weren't a lot of healthy 80-year-olds. Now there are lots of healthy 90-year-olds, uh, but not that many. And so is it possible to reset uh, the clock that uh, while everybody, while there are lots and lots of healthy 80-year-old people who in their 80 are vigorous, go backpacking in Nepal and go cycling in the Rockies and do all those wonderful things, by the time they get to be 90, um, there are far fewer of them. And even in the absence of um, um, bad diseases, um, things happen. And my understanding is how come, um, what's the reason for that? And that's what the topic is. So I don't know if anybody saw the article in the Vancouver Courier, but this is the question. So uh, just by a show of hands, who has thought about his own death? Okay. Who's thought about it? What's going to happen? How would they like to die? Right. So who would like to die older rather than younger at an older age? Well, pretty much that excludes most of us, eh? That includes most of us. So who would like to die of cancer? Well, not many takers for that. And who would like to die of, heart, of lung disease like emphysema or heart failure? Oh, well, one, not very many. Well, the rest of you have sort of s have selected out a death of dementia and gradual frailty. <laughs> so, because by, uh, by the time you get to be 80 um, and you haven't succumbed uh, to uh, diseases, Unless you're going to die of those two diseases, the chances are that you're going to um, have a long and lingering decline, which is very unfortunate. And you can see, uh, to put it mildly, um, so you can see that on the, on the top slide, uh, where, where, where how, uh, what their function is, you're pretty independent, and then unfortunately a diagnosis of cancer is made, and then, you know, then the end is, is typically quite quick. It's traumatic, but it's short. If you have episodes of heart failure or lung disease, it's somewhat longer, but you have periods of decline when you're hospitalized, and have episodes of COPD exacerbations or pneumonia or whatever, uh, but it tends to be relatively quick as well, when you retain your function. But if you have uh, dementia and frailty, uh, then, it's the, then it's the long goodbye. And that's really uh, where the challenge is. Uh, modern medicine is, is good at dealing with acute problems. We're not so good at dealing with chronic problems. We're good at going in and rescuing it, and then basically you're left with people with disability, but we're not that good at dealing with disability. So my, the, what, the, what this talk is about is how we can deal with disability and how, if necessary, prevent disability. So this is what happens when you're old and you don't uh, move so fast anymore. So George Phillips of Meriden, Mississippi was going to bed with his wife uh, one night and, and she told him that he'd left the light on in the garden shed, uh, which you could see from the bedroom window. Uh, George looked out and he, saw, he switched off the light, went to turn off the light, but he saw that there were some people in the shed stealing things. So he phoned, he phoned 911, he phoned the police and they asked him, is someone in your house? And he said no. So then they said, the patrols were all busy and they should simply lock his door and an officer would be around when available. So George said, okay, he hung up, he counted to 30 and then he phoned again. And he said, hello, I just called you a few seconds ago because of some people in my shed. Well, there's no rush because I've just shot them. And then he, <laughs> and then he hung up. Within five minutes, three police cars, an armed SWAT team and an ambulance showed up and they arrested the burglars. One of the officers said to George, I thought you said you were busy. I thought you said you shot them. I said, George said, well, I thought you said there was nobody available. <laughs> so I think that there is the wisdom of ages and how, how you can get what you need by thinking about it. That's a true story. So in the last century, in the 20th century, the average lifespan uh, has uh, increased from 47 to 73. But the maximum life, uh, the, 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 the correction, the average length of height, length of life 
has increased from 47 to, th to 73, but the maximum lifespan is not increased. So therefore, if you think about it, if, we, if on average we're living longer, but the maximum we can live haven't changed, the survival curve has assumed an ever more rectangular form, and I'll show you a slide of it in a minute. Um, and so more and more people are living into greater age. But it also turns out in the 20th century, 80% uh, of life lost to non-traumatic premature death have been eliminated. So by, the, by as of the 21st century, by the dawn of the 21st century, we've done the easy stuff. We've, we've, um, we've uh, eliminated communicable disease. There's good public sanitation. Uh, infections are, are for the most part controlled. Um, and so the easy stuff, the trauma is much less there. People don't die of starvation. So much of the easy stuff has been eliminated. The rest, the other 20%, is where the hard lifting is and what we're going to be talking about. So most premature deaths uh, are now due to chronic disease in the later years. If you think that the ideal, if we think that the average ideal um, uh, lifespan is around 85, 86, after which function declines, um, then uh, most premature deaths that occur are due to chronic diseases. Those are diseases which in theory can be prevented by uh, appropriate lifestyle. Um, and then if the other point, since um, the maximum lifespan can't be extended or hasn't been extended, if the average age at first infirmity can be raised, in other words, if we can live longer, healthier, then the period of time when we're dependent would get shorter. So one thing is true, uh, we're all going to die. Uh, if we can remain healthy, every day that we remain healthy means the time that we have left to us when we can be unhealthy is less. So if we can live healthier for longer, therefore, by definition, the period of time that we can spend being frail and unhealthy is less. And so successful aging, the definition of successful aging, is extension of adult vigor far into a fixed lifespan, since we can't change the lifespan which is fixed. But if we extend the period of, of adult vigor for longer, we can compress the period of senescence and disability to the near the end of the life. And sort of a, um, a, a pocket definition of successful aging is being healthy until the 15 minutes before you die. <laughs> and so that's what you wish for. You don't want to wish to live to be 100. You want to wish to live until, until 15 minutes before you die. And then yeah. so, you know, that, that would be a good definition. I see people nodding. And so this is what I was talking about, the rectangularization of the survival curve. Um, so you can see the bottom curve down here is, uh, it, it, this is, from, this is uh, birth up to 100, about how many people are alive. So obviously at birth, 100% of people are alive. But then if you are fortunate enough to live in the Stone Age, then 40% uh, of people uh, died within the first year. So only 60% were alive and then basically everybody died by age 40. Gradually, as, you, uh, as civilization progressed, uh, and um, in 17, 18, 16th century, 17th, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, you can see that more people are alive for longer, and the curve is, is, um, is, is looking like a rectangle. So that's what's called the rectangularization of the survival curve, and that's what you really want. However, I want to draw people's attention to this over here, which is the little tail, and that's where all the, the disability is. So blowing that up, you can see that looking in the US figures uh, from 1997, uh, women live longer than men. Um, um, you can see that uh, most men and most women are alive until their 60s and 70s, and then there's a slow drop-off, but there is still a tail of people in the, in, their, in the 10th decade, in the 90s, who are still alive. <clears throat> so um, this has been known for a long time, and there are two competing theories about what that means. So in the mid-70s, uh, an epidemiologist from Stanford named James Fries, um, he, uh, he coined the term compression of mobility. In other words, if we were living longer and healthier, you didn't have to worry about health costs because as long as you're living healthy, you're not going to cost the system anything. Uh, and then uh, living healthy, and then you're going to quickly, you're going to compress your mobility to a period of 
of a short period of time and health costs are going to go down. So he said, um, you don't have to worry because the compression of mobility is going to, self, is going to save health costs. Elaine Fries is a, a colleague of, uh, of, uh, uh, of um, uh, Elaine Murphy is a colleague of, uh, a colleague of Dr. Fries, and she challenged it and she said, "Well, that's not necessarily true. What's happening? We are we are salvaging uh, people who would have passed away, and basically these people are being a major uh, uh, are having a lot of health needs, which are actually a big stress on the system." And so for a long time there was a debate about what, is, what in fact is happening. Is it going to be the compression of the mobility, the positive, or the long goodbye, which is negative? So, suffice it to say that um, this argument between the optimist and the pessimist hasn't been resolved yet. But in fact, he published about three or four years ago follow-up data, which I didn't show because of the pressure of time, showing that there is grounds for optimism. He looked at some data from the University of Michigan uh, and, and graduates, alumni from the uh, people who graduate from the University of Michigan in the 1960s, and he followed them uh, until the 1990s. And so these people who were in their 20s uh, uh, in the 1960s and the 2000s are now in their 70s and 80s, because it's 30, 40 years later. And what he found is that the people who did, who follow, who uh, he divided them into a couple of groups: people who who kept an ideal body weight who had controlled blood pressure and didn't smoke, compared to people who were overweight who smoked and um, who, who, who didn't have controlled blood pressure. And, and, uh, though, and then um, um, you know, he, he compared various combinations. And he showed that by simply sort of just doing motherhood and apple pie, controlling your blood pressure, having an ideal body weight, not smoking, the chances of you becoming disabled were, were reduced by about 90% comparing to the high-risk group. So much of what we're doing is having an impact. Now clearly there are uh, uh, outliers and people who despite everything do poorly, but as a population-based uh, study, it, it, there is cause for optimism that the advice that we all know it uh, has the potential for paying, up, for paying off. So that leads me to the next point, the next part of the talk. Um, there are lots and lots of uh, advances in technology and every day you read about something new and some, some great uh, um, uh, breakthrough and some new tool and some new operation and some new drug. But we have to realize that, um, subs that while substantial advantages in medications have changed the natural history of many diseases and we can delay or prevent disability uh, from heart failure and osteoporosis and joint replacement and even cognitive impairment. However, uh, we have to have a word of caution. We must be careful that we don't need to make people feel guilty just because uh, you feel sick. If you feel sick, it's not your fault. If you're not having orgasms or running marathons, there's nothing wrong with you. We need to think carefully about how to take care of people who are frail. We need to allow people who, are, who we need to allow people not to feel like failures just because they can't uh, do the things that they used to do. In a society which um, values youth and accomplishment and, and and challenges, there is a time we have to balance that with the realism that things do change. And while you know the final part of my talk is going to be all gangbusters, we have to temper that with some caution to realize that. Um, there, are, there are changes that do occur with aging that are inevitable and are actually normal aging. So what are the keys uh, to, um, to aging? Everybody said, oh well, there's genes, oh well, my, 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 you know, I come from a long-lived family, or why should I take care of myself because both my parents died at age 50, so why do I need to take care of myself? I'm doomed to die an early death. Well, um, there's good news and bad news on that story. So there's a, a wonderful uh, research study from, Bo uh, from Boston University called the Centenarian Study, which you can Google. They've got an, a wonderful website. And basically, they encourage everybody who's over 100 to contact them. And then they get blood samples and they study them. And basically, they uh, have accumulated more than 1,000 people, the DNA from more than 1,000 people from between age 95 and 119. And they looked to see if there was a genetic marker which predicted these, these people who were spectacularly uh, long-aged. Uh, uh, long 
and they found 150 markers in their DNA which correlated with, with the long life. Um, many of these sequences were associated with, um, with things that we think are worthwhile, like uh, mental alertness. There's you know, nothing more disheartening um, than memory problems. There are, there, it does seem to be um, a, genetic, uh, a genetic markers or genetic pattern which, uh, at least in this population, uh, um, delays the emergence of cognitive impairment. In, insulin regulation or um, is, uh, gets to speak to the metabolic syndrome, which is sort of the key driver of all the so-called Western diseases like diabetes and heart attacks and strokes. And so there is a, a phenotype, a genetic predisposition, which seems to make people resistant to, um, uh, to developing those diseases which are so common. And DNA stability is also a very important component because if you talk about the, what causes aging, what's the genetic basis of aging, it's basically the inability to re replicate yourself. Um, and uh, when, when a cell dies, it, um, before it dies, it splits into two and makes new cells. And one hopes that the new cells are just as good as the old cell, because if it isn't, obviously there's been a change. And the ability to replicate yourself um, perfectly um, is dependent on your DNA being stable. But what happens inevitably as you get old, there's the accumulation of what's called junk DNA. And junk DNA doesn't do as good a job as proper DNA. And so errors accumulate and the cells that, um, that, are, that develop aren't this exactly the same as their parents and that's the process of aging. So if your DNA is very stable, then your cells are going to propagate in an identical way without making errors of transcription. So there are genetic markers which predispose to the three big um, determinants of aging. One would be mental alertness and the absence of dementia. Two would be cardiovascular strokes, heart attacks uh, and diabetes, kidney failure. And third would be um, aging because uh, your skin wrinkles because the cells that are, are made aren't as good as the previous cells. If your, if your DNA and your skin is perfect, there's no reason for you to have wrinkles. Oops. So what they were able to, uh, they developed a model which was able to identify 77 out of 100 known centenarians by the genetics alone. So when they looked at the thousand uh, people in their hundreds, they were able to identify 77 of them which had a good genetic pattern. Um, so carriers of these markers were far more likely, though still unlikely, to reach 100 than those who didn't. So if you're lucky enough to have one of these, 77, one of these uh, uh, patterns of genetic inheritance, you're far more likely to, to live to be 100. So that's the good news or the bad news. The, the, the other thing is that 33 of the 100 uh, centenarians didn't have any genetic uh, predisposition. So in other words, they beat the odds. So despite not having any known genetic predisposition to living to be 100, they did. So it seems to be the cumulative interaction of many genes uh, orchestrate both overall lifespan and patterns of healthy aging. But about 33, uh, out of 33 out of 100 centenarians uh, had almost none of the expected genetic markers. And therefore it seems that uh, uh, what the, what the, what the um, conclusion of the study was that good luck and a healthy living can sometimes overcome a lack, a lack luster pedigree. So even if you're not fortunate enough to uh, be blessed with a, a genetic predisposition to, have, to live to be 100, um, you've still got a 3 out of 10 chance of doing it, even if you don't have the genetics to, to back it up. So that says, I'm getting so old, all my, all my, all my friends in heaven will think I didn't make it. <laughs> So this is the oldest lady, the oldest lady, uh, she was 119, she was born, uh, Jeanne Calmet, she was born February the 21st, 1875 in France, and she died uh, in 1997, she was 122, 164 years. She, uh, she was born and died in the same place. 
And so at 85, she, she took up fencing. At 100, she was still riding a bicycle. At a, at she was living on her, uh, by herself until 110. She smoked until she was 117. And then she quit, but restarted a year later. She said, once you've lived as long as I, you can't tell me not to smoke. And some other quotes, she said, I'm only, I've only got one wrinkle and I'm sitting on it. And then she said, a very short one when asked on a 120th birthday what kind of future she would expect to have. And then another thing she said, ha, huh, I was over the hill 100 years ago. And finally, if I had known I was going to live so long, I would have taken better care of myself. So whatever her magic was, uh, she certainly had a good sense of humor. So this is another lady at age 115 who, when she passed away, she donated her brain to science and she didn't have any signs of Alzheimer's disease. She was cognitively intact and no Alzheimer's disease. So what it tells us is that dementia, which is really uh, a terrible scourge, uh, for which we only have incomplete treatment, is not part of normal aging. It's a disease. Now, it's a disease that occurs very commonly as we get older, and four out of 10 80-year-olds and five out of 10 85-year-olds will have signs of cognitive impairment, but that doesn't mean it's normal aging. So while those figures are pretty um, depressing, and they are depressing, the good news is it's not normal aging, and it's a disease. And I'm quite confident that this disease will be, will be cured. A cause will be found, and just like HIV was an untreatable illness, and AIDS was untreatable, we are now able to control it. Uh, it's not going to come tomorrow, and even the next three to five years, but it's coming.